a lecture by one of our university's most prominent scholars. An eagerly anticipated event in the acclaimed McMaster Alumni Association program. And finally, an announcement of an important new gift to our university and to the scholarly record. My name is Vivian Lewis and I have the great honour of serving as McMaster's University Librarian. And I'll be your Master of Ceremonies tonight. I'd like to begin by welcoming our guest of honour, Dr. Henry Cheroux, and Henry's esteemed wife and McMaster's Associate Vice President Faculty, Dr. Susan Searle Cheroux. Welcome to you both. I also wish to acknowledge McMaster's President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Patrick Dean, and the Dean of our Faculty of Humanities, Dr. Ken Cruikshank. <laughs> Through the course of the evening, we will hear from Patrick, from Ken, and of course from Henry, who will provide this evening's lecture a consideration of the role of the public intellectual in contemporary society. But everything begins fittingly with the words of our university's president and vice chancellor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Dean. Thank you very much, Vivian, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the McMaster family. Uh, very good to be here with you all tonight. Uh, there is a legend that comes to us across 25 centuries from ancient Greece. Uh, it involves the tragedy of a banquet hall collapsing on its occupants. It's, of course, not something one wishes to see repeated here today. <laughs> Only one person was spared, the poet Simonides, who had been summoned outside just before the disaster. In the confusion that followed, the only tool available to make sense of the chaos that had passed was Simonides' memory. And famously, he reconstructed the banquet hall in his mind, placing every victim exactly and leading family members to the very places where they could find their loved ones. Simonides had brought the contents of his mind into the physical world and assisted in the interpretation of that world after a disaster. Now, today, most of us are probably more familiar with the not dissimilar concept of the mind palace employed by Benedict Cumberbatch's incarnation of Sherlock Holmes. I have often thought of personal archives in this way. They offer us the opportunity to connect a personal intellectual life to the tangible lived historical world. Perusing the archives, we're able to walk through the mind of another person, to reconstruct a version of the past, to establish new connections, uh, to uncover and to investigate previously undiscovered insights. To a scholar, and I am one of these people obsessed with working with primary materials of that sort, this kind of access is invaluable. It is inspirational. So that is why I am proud this evening to announce that the McMaster University Library's William Reedy Division of Archives and Research Collections now has the capacity to invite us into the mind of yet another prominent scholar. This past fall, our own Henry Giroux donated his personal archive of materials from his intellectual and academic career to the University for Preservation and for study by generations of students and scholars. And Henry, this is a generous and deeply personal gift, and thank you very much for that. So Henry's archive is taking its place amidst distinguished company indeed. His work is sharing a home with the collect collected words of Pierre Burton, Farley Mowat, Austin Clark, Susan Musgrave, and McMaster alumna Marian Engel. And of course, 
Henry's archive will find a place of honor near the anchor of our collection, the Bertrand Russell Archive. Henry's collection, like Russell's, provides tremendous scholarly potential because it provides access to work that reflects the passions of a public intellectual, someone using their capacity as a scholar and a thinker to engage with the large issues of the day. But the public intellectual, this is a term we now associate uh, very easily with Henry in this institution, a role that comes without a formal appointment letter. It's not a job that is posted by or filled by a search committee. It's a kind of vocation. Serving society as a public intellectual is a privilege earned, as the title suggests, through the exercise of the intellect. But it also, very importantly, involves a large measure of tenacity. The public intellectual must do a great deal more than tweet or blog or write the occasional letter to the editor. As we've seen Henry fill the role so capably, it requires years of discipline, adherence to a set of principles, clear focus on values and ideas and ideals that may have evolutionary aspects to them, but the essence of them is that they are unwavering and, and they provide a perspective from which society and its various institutions uh, can be evaluated and commented upon. Especially today, when public discourse seems invested with a kind of digital super gravity that pulls commentary ever lower and reduces debate to a series of hashtags, we need thorough, considered, and determined argument in our society. We need thinking of the sort that is our daily concern at the university, the kind of thinking that does not reduce issues, but it instead expands them and complicates them. We need voices that will bridge the gaps between news cycles. We need people who speak thoughtfully of ideas and of ideals. So this is a role that has been Henry Giroux's for decades. And we're very proud, Henry, that McMaster has provided you with a pulpit to speak these ideas. We're very proud to be the stewards of his archive uh, and to allow generations of students and scholars to walk through his mind palace and to see what they can make of it, reconstructing and reflecting upon the period of history that we've lived through. So thank you again for this gift, Henry. Uh, the university will most certainly give your work a very good home. Thanks very much. So now it is my pleasure to invite uh, my colleague, our Dean of Humanities, Ken Cruikshank, to the podium. Ken. Henry asked me what my role was. Well, this is it. <laughs> I'm to follow the president, and that's a hard act to follow. Um, I just wanted to say a few words of thanks on behalf of not only the Faculty of Humanities, but on behalf of the university. Um, thanks to Henry, who's a force to be reckoned with. Uh, you're probably going to hear all sorts about the incredible number of widely read books he's published. Um, but we also all know that Henry is everywhere now. Uh, he can be found on writing for the mainstream media, writing for alternative media, writing on, on the internet, writing in print, uh, uh, appearing on broadcast TV. Um, and so it seems almost odd for me to be thanking you for leaving a record of your writing and your reading and your correspondence. Um, much of it, I presume, in traditional paper formats. Um, part of it finds me hard to imagine all that incendiary material captured in an archival box in tidy files uh, with neat finding aids. Um, but then I think about what happens when I've 
seen students read the papers of Bertrand Russell, when I've seen students encounter the works of Vera Britton, when I've seen students read some of the, the archives of Farley Mowat. Um, and then I have a chance to imagine a researcher, let's put them, or a student, let's put them 75 years, is that okay? 75 years in the future, uh, as far away as we get from the present. Opening one of those boxes and discovering the mind and the passion of Henry Giroux. Just imagine, boom. <laughs> there it will be a rigorous and vigorous mind in formation exploding out of those tidy file folders. Uh, we can only hope that some of his incisive analysis will feel like history by then. Um, They'll certainly, his, his work will certainly provide insights into the world of the final decades of the 20th century and let's hope for maybe the first half of the 21st century. Um, and if it does seem a little like history, that's a hopeful view, I hope it will mean that the work is all the more important because we'll be living in a world that values historical memory, that values progressive education as a fundamental component of a socially just um, world. But there's always going to be much more in that archives for those who encounter it. No matter the state of society, as they open the files and turn the pages, those future academics and students will soon find themselves called upon to continue the struggle. For we'll always need those who seek to, and I will quote, imagine a better world and to do everything possible to prevent a worse one from emerging. And now I can imagine a better world, one that preserves values and actively uses those archival boxes with men and women eager to exploit their explosive uh, potential. So on behalf of future colleagues, on behalf of future students, and on current colleagues and students, I want to thank you uh, for helping us imagine a better world and helping us work towards a better world. And thank you for your work and for the gift of your archives, Henry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Henry is very eager to speak to us tonight, but I'm going to make him wait just a, just a minute. As we've heard this evening, McMaster hosts some of Canada's most prominent uh, university archival collections. These collections are selected and they're curated with great care. And the decision to seek out a public figure's papers is made very deliberately. We weigh the importance of the individual's contributions to the scholarly record. We consider who will use the material and how well it fits in with other collections that we have. And I remember the day very clearly when we decided to approach Dr. Henry Giroux to donate the documentary records of his life and work to the archive. His name had obviously come up several times as a prolific and truly extraordinary writer. As one of the funding, uh, founding theorists of critical pedagogy and as the only McMaster author who appears to have his own section in the bookstore. <laughs> but the truly defining moment came the day when a senior archivist suggested that Henry might just be the Bertrand Russell of our era. Of course, Of course, the Russell archives, which you've heard quite a bit about tonight, are the showpiece of McMaster's rich archival collections. In fact, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Russell collection coming to McMaster next year in 2018. And Russell himself was a gifted writer, a philosopher, a social critic, a peace activist, a troublemaker. The similarities, my apologies, between Russell and Giraud were clear and the conversations began. Henry's archive, which spans approximately 15 boxes at this time, contains the research materials that have formed the foundation of his published work. It also contains photo albums, uh, scrapbooks, 
collections of clippings and correspondence and awards and even some early basketball trophies. The collection is revealing of Henry's incredible life as a public intellectual and as such will be invaluable to the researchers and the critics and the editors and the students from around the world who will come to visit the archive. But Henry uses many platforms to convey his messages, including the popular media. He is frequently called upon to comment on social and political events in the United States. And as you can imagine, he has been extremely busy in the last few weeks with uh, appointments on television, on radio, and online interviews. The following very brief video provides a small glimpse of Henry at work. You measure the worth of a society by the degree to which you invest in children. These are kids who are gonna be punished for not having access to the resources they, they should never have been denied in the first place. The skillful weaver is Henry Giroux, a scholar, teacher, and social critic with seemingly tireless energy and a broad range of interests. Henry Giroux is the son of working class parents in Rhode Island, who now holds the Global TV Network Chair in English and Cultural Studies at McMaster University in Canada. Central to politics is the challenge to be able to inform people, make power visible, and hold power accountable. That means you have to change consciousness. It means you have to work hard to expose the dark elements of authoritarian systems. That means that you have to fight for justice. I think what we're forgetting is what democracy is about. I mean, we're forgetting, at least in the United States, I mean, since the 1980s, there was a certain kind of historical turn in which we not only forgot about the practice of democracy, but increasingly about the ideals of democracy. And it's, it, for me, it, it, you know, it represents a very ominous turn. I mean, this is a country that increasingly is mocked by massive inequalities in wealth and income. A country in which increasingly more people have become disposable. A country in which we find that profit making becomes the essence of democracy. And as the social state declines and all social provisions, in a sense, are under attack, you begin to see the rise of what I call the punishing state. The, the rise of uh, very repressive practices in which endless numbers of behaviors are now criminal. For me, democracy is too important to allow it to be undermined in a way in which every vital institution that matters. There's nothing natural about this, that, that this, this really is a counter-revolution engineered by a number of extremists in primarily the Republican Party, and it's something that we need to be aware of and be very sensitive to, because in a sense, democracies like anything else come and go. Nothing guarantees them. Okay, you said a lot there. We're gonna unpack sure. the tendrils of that as we move along, but you say that democracy, do you say it doesn't, would you describe it as not existing now? I don't think democracy exists in the United States right now. I, I, I think that you, you have a country completely controlled by financial interest. Six billion dollars spent on elections. Literacy is one of the lowest indexes in which a society invests. That tells you society is failing. It's failing its children, it's failing the future, and it's failing future generations. have the pleasure of introducing Henry Giroux, professor, donor, public intellectual, and tonight's guest speaker. I believe that the details of Henry's life have brought him to this place. He has written extensively about the impact of his formative years on his career as a public intellectual in his book Disposable Youth. Henry's personal identity and his belief in the critical importance of collective action were shaped by his early experiences growing up in a white working class neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island, negotiating, as he describes, the cruelty of the dominant culture. But sports became his ticket out, and Henry was initially a disinterested student. I find that hard to believe, Henry, but uh, he was a great basketball player and he attracted the interests of some coaches and was accepted into a small college in Maine on a basketball scholarship where he eventually earned a teaching degree. 
He taught high school student uh, social studies for six years in Barrington, Rhode Island, before securing a scholarship to attend Carnegie Mellon University for doctoral studies. Henry held positions as professor of education at both Boston University and Miami University, at the latter also serving as founding director of the Center for Education and Cultural Studies. He later held the Waterbury Chair Fellow, um, Professorship at Penn State University, where he directed the Waterbury Forum in Education and Cultural Studies. In 2004, we recruited Dr. Giroux to join us here at McMaster as the Global TV Network Chair in English and Cultural Studies. He is now the director of the McMaster Center for Scholarship in the Public Interest, as well as the Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy with the McPherson Institute. Henry's CV is extraordinary. He has authored or co-authored 63 books published several hundred scholarly articles, and delivered more than 250 public lectures. He is the most cited humanities scholar in all of Canada. He has been named one of the 12 Canadians who change the way we think. And he has been listed among the top 50 education thinkers of the modern period. The timing of today's talk is brilliant. Today we celebrate Freedom to Read Week, an annual event that encourages Canadians to think about issues of intellectual freedom, both the freedom to read and the freedom to write. Henry's presence here today and his focus on the role of the public intellectual within the framework of Orwell and Huxley are fit to purpose. But you are officially on alert. Henry has been quoted as saying, a writer should cause trouble. Get ready to be challenged. Get ready to think dangerously. Get ready for Henry Giroux. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here tonight, and I, I want to thank all of you for attending. This is a very difficult building to find. And of course, I'm both grateful and honored to have been invited to donate my archives to McMaster University's Mills Library. Many people were involved in this event, and I, and I first want to thank those responsible for it. I'm especially grateful to Vivian Lewis, who has just been stunning, and Palazzo. Uh, Rick Stapleton, Wade Wyckoff, Erica Balch, Susan Wright, Wendy Batram, and Jessica Lunsbury. Thank you very much for all the help. In the spirit of Mark Twain, I also want to say that I think that honors given to individuals late in their careers are sometimes awarded to people who are viewed as too old to any longer pose a threat, make trouble, or as James Baldwin put it, to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. I would like to put on the record that I'm so certainly not going to let that happen in, it, in any case. Hence, this is not a retirement <laughs> event. <laughs> but more seriously, it's important to remember that in an age that makes it easy to lose sight of the fact that whatever achievements we as individuals have accomplished are always done with the help and collaboration of others. I've been at, I've been at McMaster University for almost 13 years. And during that time, a few people have been invaluable in both editing my work and in helping me think through many of ideas. And I want to thank three people in particular, all of whom who are here tonight. My partner, Susan Searles, Giroux. My assistant, Maya Zabatos, who is like my sister. And my co-author, Grace Pollack. I'm also grateful to McMaster University for providing me with the opportunity to continue my research my work with incredibly talented students, and to take pride in being part of a university that takes the mission of civic justice seriously. Now let me make a qualification. This speech is not about public intellectuals. I'll try to function as a public intellectual. But this speech is really called Trump's America. Rethinking Orwell's 1984 
and Huxley's Brave New World. And with that, let me begin. With the rise of Donald Trump to the office of President of the United States, politics has descended like never before to the theater of the absurd. Unbridled anti-intellectualism, deception, and vindictive chaos offer the rhetorical tools for repeating elements of a morally reprehensible past in the guise of making America great again. Advancing an aggressively alarmist agenda boasted by alternative facts, the Trump administration has unleashed a type of anti-politics that unburdens people of any responsibility to challenge, let alone collectively transform, the fundamental precepts of a society torn asunder by blatant misogyny, massive inequality, open bigotry, and violence against immigrants, Muslims, and poor minorities of color. In the new age of Trump, justice becomes the enemy of democratic leadership, and the capacity to name this collectively agreed upon reality recedes with, recedes with each assertion of fakery in infinite repetition. When evidence, science, and reason are purged of their legitimacy, politics capitulates the venomous ideals, policies, and practices one associates, policies and practices emerge that one associates with the totalitarian past. Cast into a political, existential, and ethical crisis in which it now finds itself immersed, America mimics what I call a failed state as the credibility of its democratic institutions and the trustworthiness of its leadership are called into question on the global stage. Despite the populist posturing, Trump's contempt of democratic processes is matched by his commitment to the market and economic policies that favor the financial elite. In short, as the Washington Post observed, Trump is a unique threat to democracy and a triumph for the forces of activism, racism, and misogyny. Trump's ascendancy in politics has made visible a plague of deep-seated deep civic illiteracy, a corrupt political system, and a contempt for reason that has been decades in the making. It also points to the withering of civic attachments, the decline of public life, and the use of violence and fear to shock and numb everyday people. Galvanizing his base of true believers in post-election rallies, the country witnesses how politics is transformed into a spectacle of fear, divisions, and disinformation. Under President Trump, the scourge of mid-20th century authoritarianism has returned, not only in the menacing plague of populist rallies, fear-mongering, hate, and humiliations, but also in an emboldened culture of war, militariz militarization, and the violence that looms over society like a rising storm. The reality of Trump's election may be most momentous, may be the most momentous development of the age because of, the enor of its enormity and the shock it has produced. The whole world is watching, pondering how such a dreadful event could have happened. How have we arrived here? Albert Camus understood this threat well. He warned us about the plague of authoritarianism. He warned us that how the plague of authoritarianism can reappear in updated forms. For Camus, the disease of fascism could only be fought with the antibody of consciousness, one that embraced the past as a way of protecting the present and the future. Or, or, or to put it differently, the, the, the present and the future against the unimaginable damage now forgotten. The words that form the concluding paragraph of his book, The Plague, are as relevant today as they were when they were written more than a half century ago. Camus writes, as he listened to the cries of joy rising from the town, Ryu remembered that such joy is always imperiled. He knew what those jubilant crowds did not know but could have learned from books that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good, that it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chest, 
that it bides its time in bedrooms and cellars and trunks and bookshelves and perhaps the day would come when for the bane and the enlightening of men it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. What follows is an attempt to assert the, historical, the, assert the significance of historical memory as fundamental to the preservation of a democracy in the face of an unprecedented shift towards authoritarianism. Reviving the memory of a dystopian past strikingly represented in Orwell and Huxley's fiction is a way to understand and perhaps one of the few ways left for us to fully grasp the present descent of the United States into an authoritarian nightmare. Focusing on their engagement with authoritarian visions, language, truth, and lies offers a critical arsenal of defense against the Trump era, that an era of tweets, news fakery, and the more generalized and more lethal attacks on reason, on science, on liberal modernity. I first want to begin with Orwell. Before we credit Trump with using his great novel as a code book, it is actually the case that George Orwell's terrorized, terrifying vision of a totalitarian society has been a waking dream in the United States for many years. For instance, 1984 provided a stunningly prophetic image of the totalitarian machinery of the surveillance state that was brought to life in 213 through Edward Snowden's exposure of the mass spying conducted by the United States National Security Agency. Orwell's genius was not limited to this predictive capacity alone. In addition, his fiction explores how modern democratic populations are won over by authoritarian ideologies and rituals, revealing how language specifically functioned in the service of deception, abuse, and violence. He warned in exquisite and alarming detail how, quote, totalitarian practice becomes internalized in totalitarian thinking. For Orwell, the mind-controlling totalitarian state took as its first priority a war against what he called thought crimes, nullifying oppositions to its authority, not simply by controlling access to information, but by undermining the very basis in which, in which critique is challenged and could be waged and communicated. Orwell illustrated his point by providing examples of language that weakened the critical formative culture necessary for producing thinking citizens central to any healthy democracy. And in recognizing how language fundamentally structures as much as it expresses thought, Orwell made clear how language could be distorted and circulated to function in the service of violence, deceit, and misuse and in doing so, utterly collapsed the distinction between good and evil, truth, and lies. According to Orwell, totalitarian power drained meaning of any substance by turning language against itself, exemplified through his ministry of truth, which resolved which dissolved politics into pathology by promoting such slogans as war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. Hannah Harant, Added a, theoretical, th added a theoretical weight to Orwell's fictional nightmare by arguing that totalitarianism begins with the contempt for critical thought and that the foundation for authoritarianism lies in a kind of mass thoughtlessness in which citizenry is deprived, quote, not only of its capacity to act, but also of its capacity to think and to judge. The intersection, if not merger, of popular culture and American politics was evident in the frenzy media circus that took place after Trump assumed the presidency, a fact not lost on the American public. Orwell's novel, 1984, surged as the number one bestseller on, on Amazon, both in the United States and in Canada. This followed two significant political events. First, Kellyanne Conway, Trump's advisor, in a move reminiscent of the linguistic inventions of Orwell's Ministry of Truth, coined the term alternative facts <laughs> to justify why Press Secretary Sean Spicer lied in advancing disproved, disproved claims about the size of Trump's inauguration crowd. Trump seems to be infatuated with the question of size, doesn't he? With apologies to his late father, 
a pastor, my good friend Bill Moyers, has called Conway the queen of bullshit. <laughs> the concept of alternative facts, or more precisely what should be called outright lies, is an updated term of what Orwell called doublethink, in which people blindly accept contradictory ideas or allow truth to be subverted in the name of unquestioned common sense. Second, almost within hours of his presidency, Trump penned a series of executive orders that compelled Adam Gobnick, a writer for The New Yorker, to rethink the relevance of 1985. And he states that he had to go back to Orwell's book quote, because the single most striking thing about Trump's strange first few weeks is how primitive, atavistic, and un uncomplicatedly brutal Trump's brand of authoritarianism is turning out to be. Unfortunately, the machinery of remolding manipulation and distortion has gained enormous traction at the present under the Trump administration. In this Orwellian universe, there are only winners and losers. And under such circumstances, greed, vengeance, and gratuitous cruelty aren't wrong, but are legitimate motivations for political behavior. That is, that, this is a discourse that reinforces a future in which totalitarians, totalitarianisms thrive and democracies die. As Orwell often remarked, historical memory is dangerous to authoritarian regimes because it has the power to question the past and reveal it as a site of injustice. Currently, Orwell's machinery of organized forgetting is now reinforced by a burgeoning landscape of mega malls and theme parks, media-driven displays of violence and a culture of consumerism, self-interest, and infantilizing spectacles for those who can afford participation. For the rest, the ongoing financial starvation and evisceration of public schools and public universities ensures that the lesson of history are neutered or displaced altogether by an instrumentalist curriculum whose hallmark is job-ready skills. In Orwell's Ministry of Truth, it's a crime to read history against the grain. In fact, history is falsified so as to render it useless as a crucial pedagogical practice, both for understanding the conditions that shape the present and for remembering, that, that, and, and for remembering what should never be forgotten. As Orwell makes clear, this is precisely why tyrant, tyrants consider historical memory dangerous. History can readily be put to use in identifying present day abuses of power and corruption. The Trump administration offered a pointed example of this Orwellian principle when it recently issued a statement regarding the observance of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. In the statement, the White House refused to mention its Jewish victims, thus erasing them from a monstrous act directed against an entire people. Politico reported that the official White House statement drew widespread criticism for overlooking the Jews' suffering and was observed and was cheered by, by neo-Nazi websites such as the Daily Stormer. Accounts of these events read like passages out of Orwell's 1984 and speak to what historian Timothy Snyder calls the Trump administration's efforts to look to authoritarian regimes of the 1930s as potential models. This act of erasure is but another example of the willingness of the Trump administration to empty language of any meaning, a practice that constitutes a flight from historical memory, ethics, justice, and social responsibility. And under such circumstances, government takes on the workings of a disimagination machine, characterized by another disregard for truth, and often accompanied, as in Trump's case, by primitive schoolyard taunts and threats. In this instance, Orwell's ignorance and strength materializes in, Trump's, in, in the Trump administration's weaponized attempt to not only rewrite history, but to obliterate it. Trump's contemptuous and boisterous claim that he loves the uneducated, maybe the only lie he hasn't made recently, and his willingness to act on the assertion that by flooding the media and the American public with an endless proliferation of pedal falsehoods, reveal his contempt for intellect, reason, and truth. As the master of phony stories, Trump is not only at war with historical remembrance, science, and rationality, he also wages a demolition campaign against democratic ideals 
by unapologetically embracing humiliation, racism, and exclusion for those he labels as criminals, terrorists, and losers. Categories now equated with Muslims, Mexicans, women, the disabled, and the list only grows. Orwell's point about duplicitous language was that all governments lie. The rhetorical manipulation definitive of Orwellian language is not distinctive to the Trump administration, though it has taken on an unapologetic register in redefining it and deploying it with reckless abandon. The draconian use of lies, propaganda, misinformation, and, and deploying it with reckless abandon, it seems to me, has a long legacy in the United States, with other recent examples evident under the presidency of George W. Bush. Under the Bush-Cheney administration, for example, doublethink and doublespeak became normalized as the state-sponsored state tor torture was shamelessly renamed as enhanced interrogation. Barbaric state practices such as sending prisoners to countries where there were no limits on, the to on, on torture were framed in the innocuous language of rendition. Such language made a mockery of policy discourse and eroded public engagement. It also contributed to the transformation of institutions that were meant to limit human suffering and protect citizens from the excesses of the market and state violence into something like their opposite. The attack on reason, on dissent and truth, finds its Orwellian apogee in Team Trump's endless prolif proliferation of lies, including claims that China is responsible for climate change. Former President Obama was not born in the United States, and voter fraud prevented Trump from winning the popular vote for the presidency. Such lies, big and small, don't function simply as mystification. They offer justification for aggressive immigration crackdowns, for effectively silencing the EPA, and for upending Obamacare. Too often, the relentless fabrications serve to direct the press, focusing their energies on exposing the untrustworthiness of the person and not on the symbolic, legal, and material violence that such pronouncements and harsh policies invariably unleash. Allow me to underscore one more striking example. In moments that speak to an alarming flight for moral and social responsibility, Trump has adopted, has, has adopted terms strongly affiliated with the legacy of anti-Semitism and Nazi ideology. For example, historian Susan Dunn refers to the use of his phrase, America first, as a sulfurous expression connected historically to the name of the isolationist, defeatist, anti-Semitic uh, national organization that, that urged the United States to, ap to appease Adolf Hitler. Did I say anti-Semitic? Utterly Semitic. Utterly anti-Semitic. It is also associated with its most powerful advocate, Charles Lindbergh, a notorious anti-Semite who once declared that America America's greatest internal threat came from Jews who posed a danger to the United States because of their, quote, large ownership and influence in our motion, in our motion pictures, our press, the radio, and our government. And though Trump denies that he gives a platform to neo-Nazi groups, let alone a White House senior advisor, the shocking uptake in bomb threats to dozens of Jewish community centers across the United States can hardly be said to be accidental or coincidental. Once he was elected president, Trump took ownership of the notion of fake news, inverting its original uses as a critique of his perpetual lying and redeploying it as a pejorative label, label aimed at journalists who criticized his policies. Even Trump's inaugural address was filled with lies about rising crime rates and the claim that of unchecked carnage in America, though crime rates are at historical lows. His blatant disregard for the truth reached another high point soon afterwards with his nonsensical and false claim that the mainstream media lied about the size of his inaugural crowd, or more recently his assertion that leaks involving his national security advisor were real, but the news about them was fake. <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> Trump's penchant for lying and his irrepressible urge to tell, to tell them are more than what, are more than what Gopnik calls Big Brother Crude, the expression of a pure, raging, authoritarian id. 
They also speak to an effort to undermine freedom of speech and truthfulness as core democratic values. Trump's endless threats, fabrications, outrages, orchestrated chaos produced with dizzying velocity also points to a strategy for asserting power while encouraging, if not emboldening, his followers to think the unthinkable, ethically and politically. While it may be true that all administrations lie, what is unique to the Trump administration, as Charles Sykes, a former conservative radio host, no less, observes, quote, is an attack on credibility itself. Echoes of earlier authoritarian societies are not only audible in Trump's falsehoods, petulance, and crudeness, but also in his slash and burn policies and his less discussed embrace of white supremacy. For example, his racism was on full display in the issuance of an executive order banning citizens from seven Muslim majority countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, and Libya. The conditions permitting such an executive order, the conditions permitting such an executive order to be thinkable, let alone entered into policy, not only signals a society that has stopped questioning itself, but points to the embrace of a form of social engineering that, was, that is once again being constructed around an imagined assault that legitimates a form of state-sponsored racial and religious purging, purging, driven by an attempt to create a white Christian nation governed by biblical values. Racial cleansing, cleansing based on a generalized notion of identity echoes the sordid principles of earlier policies of prohibition and eventual extermination that we saw in past regimes that gave birth to the unimaginable horrors and intolerable acts of mass violence. This is not to suggest that Trump's immigration policies has risen as yet to the level of genocide and vitriol and sordid extermination policies of totalitarian regimes that gave birth to unimaginable horrors and intolerable acts of violence. But it is to suggest that they contain elements of a past totalitarianism that heralds a possible model for the future. What I am arguing is that this form of radical exclusion based on the denigration of Islam as a closed and timeless culture marks a terrifying entry into a political experience that suggests that the older elements of totalitarianism are crystallizing in new forms. There can be little doubt about the ideological direction of the Trump administration given his appointment of billionaires, generals, white supremacists, representatives of the corporate elite, and the general incompetence, and general incompetence to the highest level of government. Public spheres that once offered at least a glimmer of progressive ideas, enlightened social policies, non-commodified values, and critical dialogue and exchange have and will be increasingly commercialized or replaced by private spaces and corporate settings whose ultimate fidelity is to increasing profit margins. We are witnessing under this administration, what we are witnessing is more than an aesthetics of vulgarity as the mainstream media sometimes suggest. Instead, we are observing a politics fueled by a market-driven view of society that has turned its back on the idea that social values, public trust, and communal relations are fundamental to a democratic society. It is to Orwell's credit that in his dystopian view of society, he opened the door for all to see a nightmarish future in which everyday life becomes harsh, an object of state surveillance and control, a society in which the slogan, ignorance becomes strength, morphs into a guiding principle of the highest levels of government, mainstream media, education, and popular culture. Aldous Huxley, Aldous Huxley's brave new world offers a very different and no less critical register to the landscape of state oppression. One that is, is especially relevant with the rise of Trump to the presidency of the United States. Huxley believed that social control and the propagation of ignorance could be introduced by those in power to a fast, through a vast machinery of what he called manufactured needs, desires, and identifications. Accordingly, the real drugs of a controlled society and social planning were to be found in a culture that offers up immediate pleasure 
sensationalism and gratification. This new mode of persuasion seduced people into chasing commodities and infantilized them through the mass production of easily digestible entertainment, mass rallies, and a politics of distraction that dampened, if not obliterated, sometimes the very possibility of thinking itself. If Orwell's image is the stuff of government oppression, as he puts it, a boot stamping on the human face forever. Huxley's dystopia is the stuff of entertaining diversions, stage spectacles, and a cauterizing of the social imagination. For instance, as public schools are defunded to the point where they serve mostly a warehousing function in the United States, they no longer provide a bulwark against civic literacy. In addition, the educational function of, the, of wider cultural apparatuses is now present in the new mechanisms of social planning and engagement found in the hallucinatory power of a kind of mind-deadening entertainment industry, the culture of extreme sports and other forms of public pedagogy which extend from Hollywood movies and video games to mainstream television news and the social media. These cultural apparatuses are the echo chambers that produce spectacles of extreme violence, representations of hyper-masculinity, the, the infantilization produced by consumer culture and frenzied shoppers, and the power of a fatuous celebrity culture encouraging the worship of lifestyles, all of which confers enormous authority on the likes of the rich and infamous, such as the dreadful Kardashians. <laughs> as Huxley predicted, the memory of totalitarian methods of popular seduction with its ready supply of simplistic answers, its vulgar spectacles, and its taste for massification, hawking fear, and its exploitation of the desire for strong leaders has faded in a society beset by, amnesic, by an amnesic-producing culture of immediacy, consumerism, and mindless spectacles. Under such circumstances, it's difficult to misjudge the depth and the tragedy of the collapse of civic culture and democratic public spheres. For those outside the influence of consumer culture, one that depoliticizes and infantilizes, there is a permanent war culture that trades in fear, paranoia, and paranoia concerning enemies at home and abroad while maintaining the largest prison system in the world with 2.2 million in jail and more than 4.8 million on parole. Another shocking and revelatory indication of the repressive fist of authoritarianism is in the, in the Trump regime took place when Trump's chief White House strategist, Steve Bannon, stated in an interview that the media should be embarrassed and humiliated and keep its mouth shut and just listen for, the while, for a while. He states, you're the opposition party, not the Democratic Party. The media is the opposition party. They don't understand the country. Unsurprisingly, Bannon referred to himself in the same interview as Darth Vader. A more appropriate comparison might have been to Joseph Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda in the Third Reich. This is more than an off-the-cuff ang angry comment. It's a blatant refusal to see the essential role of a robust and critical media in a democracy. In the views of Trump and Bannon, real journalism is denounced, especially when it functions as the enemy of injustice, corruption, oppression, and deceit. How else to explain a US president calling journalists among the most dishonest human beings in the world, quote unquote, going so far as to claim, quote, that the media are the enemy of the American people. These are an ominous and alarming comments that not only suggest that journalists can be tried with treason, but also echo, echo previous totalitarian regimes which wage war on both the press and, the democ and democracy itself. As Roger Cohen observes, enemy of the people is a phrase with a near perfect totalitarian pedigree deployed with refinements by the Nazis, Stalin, and Mao. For Goebbels, writing in 1941, every Jew was a sworn enemy of the people. Hence the people, here the people rather, are an aroused mob imbued with some mythical essence of nationhood or goodness by a charismatic leader. The enemy is everyone else. Citizenship with its shared rights and responsibilities has ceased to be. A public 
shaped by manufactured ignorance and indifferent to the task of discerning the truth from lies, largely applauded this expression of totalitarian bravado, especially when it cites hatred and violence. Trump's call to build a wall between the United States and Mexico and his consideration of using the national guard to round up illegal immigrants arouses applause from his followers, as does Trump's penchant for disparaging all critics as losers, reminiscent of the ways failed contestants were treated on his reality TV show, The, App the Apprentice. Dissenting journalists and others have refused access to government officials, derided as purveyors of fake news. They become objects of retribution while being told to shut up. And in the course of being symbolically fired, they're relegated to zones of terminal exclusion. Under the new authoritarian state, perhaps the greatest threat that one faces is not simply being subject to the dictates of arbitrary power, but when too few people seem interested in contesting such unde undemocratic use of power. It is precisely the poisonous and pervasive spread of political indifference that puts at risk the fundamental principles of justice and freedom which lie at the heart of any viable democracy. Trump's presidency signals the unimaginable in that the, de the democratic imagination has been transformed into a public relations machine that marshals its inhabitants into the neoliberal dream world of obedient subjects, babbling consumers, and armies of exploitive labor. This is the brave new surveillance punishing state that merges Orwell's big brother with Huxley's mind-altering modes of entertainment, education, and propaganda. The question now confronting us is what will American society look like under a Trump administration? For those not mocked by terminal exclusion and disposability, it may well mimic Huxley's nightmarish world in which corruption is rampant, ignorance is a political weapon, and pleasure is utilized as a form of control, offering nothing more than the swindle of fulfillment, if not something more deluding and self-defeating. Both Huxley and Orwell pointed, presented their visions of closed dystopian societies as warnings, as critical frameworks to shake us out of our complacency, because they believed that avoiding a catastrophic future necessitated a more open society disinclined to model itself after the horrific images they so brutally imagined. Democracy in the United States is under siege, but the forces of resistance are mobilizing around a, new, a renewed consciousness in which civic courage and the ethical imagination are being realized once again through mass demonstrations in which individuals are putting their bodies on the line once again, refusing Trump's machinery of misogyny, nativism, and white supremacy. Airports are being occupied. People are demonstrating in the streets of major cities. Town halls have become sites of resistance. Universities are being transformed into sanctuaries to protect undocumented students. And liberal universities and liberal and progressive politicians are speaking out against the emerging authoritarianism. Democracy may be in exile in the United States and imperiled in Europe and other parts of the globe, but the spirit that animates it is far from defeated. Once again, the public memory of prophecy is in the air, echoing Martin Luther King Jr.'s call to make, the re to make real the promise of democracy. And what follows, I want to offer one strategy for resistance by developing what I call democracies in exile. The concept is intended to provide a rhetorical referent and material space that refuses the sense of expulsion, isolation, and punishment that derives from being metaphorically or materially barred from one's own country and unites the ideal and promise of a substantive democracy with systemic forms of political engagement. It offers a model for critical consciousness in an ethical space where we can encounter the pain of others and truly reflect on its significance to a shared community. Such sanctuaries do more than simply offer refugees protection and services, such as emergency shelters, recreation, public transit, libraries, food banks, and police and fire services without asking questions about their status. They also point to and beyond the identification of structures of domination and repression in search of a new understanding and imaginative response to the ominous 
ominous forces at work in American society mocked by a collapse of civic culture, literacy, and shared citizenship. Such spaces constitute a new educational and political apparatus for people to learn together, to engage in extended dialogue, and to fashion political formations in the service of fighting for political, economic, and social justice. This radically expanded notion of sanctuary takes seriously that the fact that democracy cannot survive without informed citizens. Democracies in exile are grounded in a discourse of critique and hope, self-reflection, and a comprehensive understanding of politics. As a mode of critique, they offer spaces for critical dialogue, collaboration, and what it means to rethink the meaning of, the, of politics. As a discourse of hope, they offer the policy of organizing new levels of resistance designed to dismantle a society that is emulating totalitarian conditions given its attack on dissent. The social contract and individuals and groups who are being mocked as deficient or disposable because of their religion, race, or country of origins. These models for democracy are open collectivities joined in the spirit of compassion and justice. They mock the antithesis of Trump society, of walls, punitive laws, and gated communities. They signal a mode of witnessing and organized resistance inspired by a renewed commitment to justice and equality. This is the spirit of redemption matched by, matched by mass protests, such as the recent A Day Without Immigrants strike, and the 4.2 million who took to the streets in protest on Trump's second day in office. In both cases, the aim was to demonstrate the productive power of people in the struggle to take back democracy. These zones of resistance offer an opportunity to fuse popular movements and, and traditional uh, tr traditional institutions that in some way have often not worked together. They offer the opportunity in many ways to fuse traditional sites of struggle such as unions, churches, and synagogues. Such outposts offer new models of collaboration united by a perpetual striving for a more just society. And as such, they join in solidarity in their, and in their differences mediated by respect for the common good, human dignity, and decency. Together, they resist a demagogue in his coterie of reactionaries who harbor a rapacious desire for concentrating power in the hands of a financial elite and the economic and political religious fundamentalists who seek to amass power by any means necessary. This mode of opposition connects the task of both raising consciousness and mobilizing against the suffocating ideologies, worldviews, and policies that are driving the new authoritarianism. <clears throat> The alternative spaces and new public spheres reflect what Sarah Evans and Harry Boyd calls free spaces, which take on the task of ongoing community education designed to revitalize civic education and civic courage. These spaces for resistance make clear that socially responsible citizens can and will demand that the United States make good on its claim as a beacon of inclusion and hope, determined to reject all forms of exploitation and racial cleansing. What might it mean to create a public sphere and institutions that represent models of a democracy in exile? Sanctuaries that preserve the ideals, values, and experiences of an insurrectional democracy. What might it mean to imagine a landscape of resistance in which the metaphor of democracies in exile inspires and energizes young people, educators, workers, artists, and others to engage in political and pedagogical forms of resistance that are disruptive, transformative, and emancipatory? What might it mean to create multiple protective spaces of resistance that would allow us to think crit critically, ask troubling questions, take risks, transgress established norms, and fill the spaces of everyday life with ongoing acts of nonviolent opposition? What will it take to create entire cities whose diverse institutions function as sanctuaries for those who fear expulsion and state terror? How might we together generate modes of coordinated resistance that challenge this new and terrifying horizon of authoritarianism that has overshadowed the ideals of an already fragile and wounded democracy? The concept of democracies in exile is not a prescription or a rationale for cynicism. 
nor is it a retreat from one's role as an informed and engaged citizen. On the contrary, it's a space of energized hope where the realities of a new authoritarianism along with its racist, morally obscene, and politically death-dealing practices can be revealed, analyzed, challenged, and defeated. The United States now occupies an historical moment in which there will likely be an overwhelming acceleration of violence, oppression, lawlessness, and corruption. These are truly frightening times that must be confronted if a radical democratic future is not to be canceled out. There is no choice but to stop Trump's machinery of civil and social death from functioning. It has to be brought to an end in every space landscape and institution in which it tries to shut down the foundations of democracy. Reason and thoughtfulness have to, be, have to awake from the narcoticizing effects of a culture of spectacle, consumerism, militarism, and unchecked self-interest. The body of democracy is on life support and the wounds now being inflicted upon it are alarming. This certainly raises questions about what role educational institutions should take in the face of the impending tyranny. One of the challenges facing the current generation of educators, students, progressives, and other concerned citizens is the need to address the role they might play in the face of such an authoritarianism. And at the heart of such efforts is the question of what education should accomplish in a democracy under siege. What work do educators have to do to create the political ethical conditions necessary to endow young people and the general public with the capacities to think, to question, to doubt, to imagine the unimaginable and defend education as a central for, ins for inspiring and informed thoughtful citizenry integral to the existence of a robust democracy in a world in which there is an increasing abandonment of egalitarian and democratic impulses in the erasure of historical memory. What will it take to educate young people in the broader polity to learn from the past and understand that the present, that, that the present and, and the present in order to challenge authority and to hold power accountable? One option is for universities to become sanctuaries for democracies in exile. That would mean creating public spaces for the most vulnerable, illegal immigrants and those deemed disposable, but also serve as a beacon for equipping students and others with the knowledge, the skills, the experiences, and the values that they need to participate in the struggle to keep the ideal and the practices of democracy alive. For many universities, this would mean renouncing their utterly instrumental approach to knowledge, empowering faculty to connect their work with important social issues, as they do here refusing to treat students as customers, choosing administrative lead leaders who have a vision rooted in the imperatives of ethics, justice, social responsibility, and democratic values. The culture of business has become the business of education. And to be frank, it has corrupted the mission of too many universities. It is necessary for students, faculty, and others to reverse this trend at a time when the dark shadows of authoritarianism are engulfing so much of the planet, threatening not only the spaces for critical inquiry, but democracy itself. We must ask, what's the role of, what, what role might education, historical memory, and critical pedagogy ha have in a larger society in which the social has become individualized? Political life has collapsed into the therapeutic. And education has been reduced to either a private affair or a kind of algor algorithmic mode of regulation in which everything is reduced to some kind of desired empirical outcome. That's not an argument against empirical evidence. That's an argument against empiricism. What role could a resuscitated critical education play in challenging the deadly neoliberal claim that all problems are individual? when the roots of such problems lie in larger systemic forces. What might it mean to enable people to learn how to translate private issues into public considerations? What might it mean to say that education in some fundamental way is about teaching people not how to simply be governed, but how to govern? What cannot be forgotten is that, in this, that, that, that this is an authoritarian regime that we are now facing that draws from a fascist history that unleashed nothing short of large-scale terror, violence, and the death of the civic imagination. At the same time, it seems to me, any confrontation with the current historical moment has to be conquered with a sense of hope and possibility. 
so that intellectuals, artists, workers, educators, and young people can imagine otherwise in order to act otherwise. Fortunately, diverse groups extending from union members and women's movement to other progressively oriented social formations, such as the Moral Monday movement, the Block, Block the Pipeline campaigns, along with a growing interest in, or growing resistance by teachers, actors, and artists, are organizing to protest Trump's neo-fascist ideologies and policy. Optimism and sanity are in the air. And the agency and the urgency of mass action and the collective power of resistance has taken on a renewed relevance. The Women's March on Washington was a hopeful symbol of collective opposition. Thousands of scientists have rallied against the attacks on scientific inquiry, the perils of climate change, and other forms of evidence-based research, and they are planning further marches at the end of March of this year. A number of big city mayors are refusing to allow their cities to become pale imitations of the previous authoritarian regimes. Demonstrations are taking place every day throughout the country. Students are mobilizing on campuses and all over the globe. Women are marching to protect their rights. What we are witnessing is a massive broad-based struggle intent on producing forms of nonviolent res non resistance at all levels of society. And accordingly, it's important to heed Rabbi Michael Lerner's insistence that a democracy-minded public, workers, and activists of various stripes need a new language of critique and possibility, one that embraces a movement for a world of love, courage, and justice while being committed to a mode of nonviolence in which the means are as ethical as the ends sought by such struggles. Such a call is as historically mindful as it is insightful drawing upon the legacies of nonviolence resistance by renowned activists such as Bertrand Russell, Saul Alinsky, Paulo Freire, and Martin Luther King Jr. Despite their diverse projects and methods, these voices for change all shared a commitment to collective and fearless struggle in which nonviolent strategies rejected passivity and compromise for powerful expressions of opposition. We would do well to heed the words of the great abolitionist Frederick, Doug Frederick Douglass, who argues, it's not the light that is needed, but fire. It's not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The pr propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed, and the crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a, man, a demand. It never did, and it never will. We live at a time in which totalitarian forms are with us again. Hopefully, rage and anger will move beyond condemnation and demonstrations to develop a movement whose power will be on the side of justice, not injustice. Bridges, not walls. Compassion, not hate. Let's hope it develops into a worldwide movement capable of dispelling Orwell and Huxley's nightmarish vision of the future in our own time. The dark shadows of authoritarianism may be spreading, but it can be stopped. And that prospect raises serious questions about what educators, artists, youth, intellectuals, all of us can do to not succumb to the authoritarian forces circling American society and other parts of the globe. My friend, the late Howard Zinn, rightly insisted that hope is the willingness to hold out, even in times of pessimism, the possibility of surprise. To add to that, to this eloquent plea, I would say collective opposition is no longer an option. It's a necessity. Thank you. We're going to take questions, but first we're going to set up a mic that we'll put in the middle of the aisle. And if you ask a question I don't like, I'll just turn the mic off. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Do you want to use the mic? Because I don't think other people can hear you.
thanks very much for the lecture. I really admire you, as you know, and I read a lot of your books. Um, how close are we to the uh, slippery slope of fascism? And um, how susceptible are our values uh, to the gravitational pull of our neighbor? What are the indications we should look for for uh, fascism here, and what can we do about it? No, I, it's a terrific question. I mean, I, I think that, you know, fascism has, in, in many ways, though it tends to emerge in different forms, it has, there, there, there are certain consistencies that you begin to hear in the language. You know, you, you have entire peoples being demonized. You have the rise of the great savior. You know, you, you have a call that seems to suggest that a country is in such decline that we have to go back to a past, you know, when we could forget about indigenous people, when white people ruled, when in fact the systemic injustices that operated were really not as bad as they are today. We hear it in the call that somehow the attribute of violence has a cleansing effect in terms of what it might do to protect a, a society from, from what, we, what we might label as this decline. We hear it in the, in, the, in the echo of the spectacles. You know, these spectacles that seem to suggest that dissent is somehow contaminated, that journalists are somehow evil, that universities are dominated by leftists, that religious fundamentalism really in its most extreme forms really provides the biblical values that will take us back to a time when a, you know, a particular religious ideology was seen as acceptable for ruling a nation. It's a discourse against diversity. It's a discourse against justice. It's a discourse against the public good. It's a discourse that derides public services. It's a discourse that only speaks in privatized rights. It rarely ever speaks in ways that elevate the social to a notion that suggests that we have to have a profound kind of investment in what we might call the public good or in the commons. This is an argument, this is a discourse that does everything to concentrate power in the hands of a relatively financial and economic elite. And I think that I'm shocked when I listen to programs now, recent, more recently in Canada, and I hear people invoking the language of totalized cultures, saying things like, well, we, you know, we need to protect our culture. You know, that's what Camus talked about. That's the language of the virus. That's a language that undercuts justice. That's a language that seems to suggest that diversity is a pathology. That's a language that it seems to me has to be resisted in every way. The second answer to that question is, what can we do? Is we've got to take civic literacy seriously. I mean, it matters to educate people to know about their history. It matters to educate people to know something about the injustices that informed it. It matters to educate people in terms of what's been left out. It matters to say that social responsibility is a virtue and not a liability. Sir, those of us who heard Mr. Trump speak were shocked, obviously. But the truth is, it's not new. No. We have seen everything in what Trump said many times before. In uh, 1870, um, there was a, a similar explosion in the United States. Uh, the story of Judy Garland and the, um, uh, the Wizard of Oz was really about that. And the wizard uh, was the president. <laughs> And um, the tin man was the worker, and the straw man was the, the laborer. And they were in this similar crisis. And we've seen this. The problem is not that these things happen, but uh, Americans don't know history. And they replay this history again and again. Is it philosophy we need? And I love philosophy. But is it the history we need to do, take? There was the previous explosions under Reverend Edwards in the United States, the evangelical uh, periods, the Dwight L. Moody's. And when President uh, spoke, uh, actually he was using all the evangelical techniques that we're so familiar with, with other people. It is not new. No, I, I, it's, it's, and it's, it's, I was shocked. No, the, the issue I, I think is not that it's new. The issue is that it's moved from the margins of American society to the center of power. That's what's new. It, I think it's a measure of the desperation that people have no roots, no ties. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I thank you. I think it's a lovely and wonderful question. And I, and I, I think that one of the things that I 
you know, I'm very concerned about, and I'm sure many of you are, is that you know, we find ourselves increasingly in, in societies that are governed by shock-like values. You know, we're all part of a reality TV ethic in which the only person left is the, the one person on the island. We sort of lost what it means to talk about community. We've lost what it means to talk about shared values. We've lost what it means to talk about citizenship in a way that suggests that one cannot exist in a society without some sensitivity to the other. And I think that the, 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 the couple that with massive inequalities in which time becomes a burden for m many people, not a luxury. You know, my dad, working class guy, his car broke down, he walked home. Time was a burden for him. I, I get on the phone, I call CAA, they come and pick my car up and they take it away. I have students in my class that work 40 hours a week, time is a burden for them. You know, there are students who don't work and time is more of a luxury for them. There are people who basically, to put it bluntly, are operating under what I call the emergency state of survival. And that's all they can do. They think, well, they make decisions like, what does it mean to either eat or have medicine for my children? What does it mean to not have a job and all of a sudden to blame myself? What does it mean to live in a society where you have a party of extremists who are cutting away every social provision that matters? And when they do so, they say that the people who basically need those provisions are either lazy, stupid, or ignorant. I mean, if we don't have, it seems to me, the educational apparatuses, if we don't have modes, a language, if we don't have possibilities for critique, if we don't have spaces to support people to engage in that critique, then public trust, public values, and social justice die. Democracies die. Dewey was right. He was right on these issues. You can't have a democracy without informed citizens. And I think one of the great problems we have seen, both particularly on the left and not on the right, is that the left, in many ways, believes that all forms of domination are basically structural, economic. And what they have failed to realize is that education is at the center of politics. You have to change consciousness in order to enable people to, in some way, be able to identify in the language that they're hearing the very conditions in which they find themselves. That takes time. I'm not going to call Trump supporters stupid. I think that's offensive. What I believe is that's a pedagogical challenge. I want to know how they got there. I want to know wh why they believe that. I want to know how that in some way functions in a way that's at odds with reality. I want to know why that investment seems so desperate and what are the conditions that drive it. Shame is bad pedagogical political practice. It doesn't work. I mean, what we need to do is we need to talk to each other, provide the spaces where people can listen and take seriously what it means to live in a country in which literacy basically is the basis for not only changing conscience, but making sure that the flame of justice and democracy stays alive because it's always a struggle. My late friend, wonderful friend, just died, Sigmund Bauman. You know, he used to tell me, he used to say, Henry, societies are never just enough. They're never just enough. That struggle is non-ending. There's no period at the end of the sentence when we talk about democracy. It just keeps going. And every generation, we have a responsibility for every generation, from librarians to university presidents to, uh, to deans to faculty, to make sure that we say to students, look, we don't believe in just short-term investments. We believe in long-term investments. It's not just the bottom line. It's also about making an investment in your generation so your future can be better than our future. So you can be equipped to look back at an older generation and say, they provided the guideposts for us. We're not alone. We're not overburdened by debt. We're not overburdened with not having jobs. We're not overburdened by a culture of immediacy and idiocy that we can't work through, that we don't know how in some way to come together in acts of solidarity with people who are black, brown, and other, and realize that we all bleed together, to use that metaphor. We bleed together. Democracy is not a society inhabited by isolated individuals. It's a society inhabited by collectives of people who share respect for their differences and more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, not just for your comments, um, but also for the generous gift that you have made to us this evening. Friends, this concludes the formal part of our program. We do, however, have drinks in the bar.
uh, to the left as you exit the hall, and also other refreshments in the West Room to the right. As well, colleagues from the Campus Bookstore are here this evening with a collection of Henry's books for sale, and Henry assures me that he is more than happy to sign your book if you ask. Finally, we have arranged a few select items from the Henry Giroux archive for you to peruse as you enjoy the company of good friends and new friends. Thank you to Renu Barrett and to Audrey Schell from the archives for pulling this together for us. So please linger and enjoy the rest of the evening and thank you for being part of this celebration.